uh, opening the uh, February 5th uh, meeting of the Board of School Directors for the Montbury Rock Monthly at Roxbury School District. Uh, first, a quick <coughs> agenda item. Um, we had talked about <coughs> taking the superintendent's report um, and making it a separate item. We will remove that off the agenda, make it a separate item, and it will appear as a separate item going forward. So that just didn't get communicated before this got printed. So um, easy fix. Um, could we? Executive session is on the agenda for later. Yes. Um, could we also add in the executive session a chance to talk about our okay. collective bargaining? Yep, definitely. Yeah. Um, and then also just a quick announcement. We have uh, a couple of additional administrative position searches um, going forward. Uh, Libby's already recruited well, has already talked to you, and Steve is willing to serve on the SPED director position, and Jerry is willing to serve on the RBS principal position, so I just wanted to let folks know that. And if there is a burning desire for someone else to serve on one of those committees, um, let us know, but I want to give a chance before they get too far along. Thank you, Darren. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Yes, and as you probably know, we have two very exciting principal candidates for MSMS coming on Monday, um, and there'll be some times, I think 7.30, 11, and mm -hmm. perhaps again at 6 for, uh, is there a separate time for board members or board members? No, public. Yeah, yeah. Um, to meet them, and uh, you probably, I'm assuming most of you know Roy, uh, but uh, it's, and the times are 7.30 and 11 for the public? For yes. the public, and I think we're adding the 6 o'clock too for people who, you know, that doesn't mesh with either their morning or lunch hour, so. Um, and who is yeah. making the, the hiring decision? Is that us or Libby? Libby is, okay. So, so, um, I'll input should feedback. probably go to you. I'll do, yeah. give feedback forms to, um, just like in the high school. Yeah. Everybody will have feedback forms. They all come to me, I'll synthesize and all that kind of stuff. Okay. I noticed that, um, unless I noticed it, that information was not in the weekly middle school email this week. I just wanted to flag that so that it could get circulated. Okay. It may have been that um, Pam just had another grandchild born, and oh, she is away this week, so that may have been written prior to the announcement mm -hmm. and, sent, and scheduled to be sent out. So I don't know why, but that may, may be the reason. Maybe we could send a, a short thing that says, it's on Facebook. It would. It would if, if the middle school could get out an announcement, that yeah. would be ideal. Yeah, that would be good. <coughs> and <coughs> probably that would have to happen tomorrow, ideally. I've so. already made eyes with Anna, and she. <laughs> 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 we have already had that communication. Did <laughs> <laughs> not all see that. <laughs> Nice. It has happened twice since we started the board. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Noted. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good deal. Um, so, public comment, um, first order. None. Um, so, consent agenda, and we've already taken the superintendent's report off. So, motion to approve the consent agenda. If I have this right, it's to approve the consent agenda, adding so, the additional letter of recognition that was distributed just a few minutes ago and subtracting the superintendent's report? Yes. So moved. I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Excellent. Um, so learning focus, uh, the RBS gazebo. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Um, well, let me just give you each one of these so that you can have more information about it. Basically, Hold on, Where, this is Dottie Guigri. Yes. She is the preschool teacher here Be at. Careful, there's yeah, I see it. Right. Just wow. making sure everybody knows. Oh, good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Basically, we're asking for permission to put a gazebo there and also for some financial assistance in putting it there. Thank you. And I brought a couple of visuals with me here that you can look at. 
This one is. Okay. This one is basically, you know, what it would look like. It's a 10 sided cedar gazebo, it's 20 feet um, in size, and it would provide. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Okay. It would provide um, some shade, which the new regulations for playgrounds are saying that we need some shade out here. But it would also be basically for the school to have an outdoor classroom that which would connect with a lot of our um, science-based learning. And it would also um, be a place where um, we could have celebrations rather than indoors in the gym space and it would be a place where the community itself could utilize it when the school was not open during the summers, in the spring and fall when the weather is good. Um, but it would, be, it would add something to our community and it would also add to the school. And this, when I discussed it with um, the facility manager, he said he would need some engineering drawings, which the company that builds the gazebo um, said, said to me. And we basically need to do some site work, which would allow a concrete base to put it on. And it would also need um, a, a trench to put some electricity out to it from the school, are the two things site-wise. And this is the, how they suggest attaching it and the actual shape of it. And on the playground, um, I looked at a map of the town, and basically, Roxbury, this is our main street, our main and only intersection. And um, it would be a place, we, we would line it up with, across the street, right now there is an old abandoned church that has a wood shop in it that they're trying to sell but it's a nice traditional building and if we lined it up with the center of that and with our door out from the um, wing of the school that would be it would locate be located in a place on the playground the children never go to i've been here eight years and kids play over here on playground equipment, um, but they and they play on the soccer field, but they never use that corner of the or that section of the playground, so it wouldn't interfere with any previous um, plans for using it. And um, I would be happy to answer any questions you have, but on the sheet that you have there, um, basically we are um, proposing that at town meeting day uh, we will have a table set up in the hallway as people come in and leave and we will be showing images of this and asking the community's help in raising funds for it um, we would be asking the school um, to put in the funds in order to do the site work and that might be around ten thousand dollars <coughs> But altogether, you know, we've raised 5000 so far for the gazebo. So we have 25000 to go. And we're planning to do something at town meeting. We're also planning to reach out to friends and businesses in the area and organizations that might find this worth their consideration. Thanks, Dottie. Um, OK. Yeah. I have a question because it sounds like a great idea. Yeah. And uh, my question has to do with timing. Timing. This could have been in the budget. Mm. Well, it's we've been talking about it since fall, and um, this is the first chance that we've gotten any realistic idea. We had planned to do. We had planned actually to put something on the on the town um, budget. And the selectmen didn't like that idea and didn't want, even though we collected 20 or 30 signatures, they said, you'll make more money by doing it individually than if they shoot it down, you won't get anything. So um, it didn't get on the budget, but we would like to get it done this year, this summer. 
I mean, I think Tina was referring to the school budget, mm -hmm. the district yeah. oh, I'm budget, sorry. not the town I was, budget. Yeah. Right, I was okay. thinking oh, it's budget. a great idea, and yeah. you know, we would have discussed it with our budget, right. perhaps put it in the budget. Okay, well, I guess perhaps we weren't aware enough of your, your timetable, I'm sorry. I, can I speak to that? Yeah. Um, in talking with Grant this morning about, did he talk about this in the Finance Committee? Mm -hmm. He did. So, um, so you probably know exactly what I'm going to share. So, uh, if Grant were here, um, he would say that um, he would rather, as the business manager, being fiscally responsible for our budget, put this in school funding rather than fundraising. He has several concerns over fundraising for this. Mm -hmm. And if it's something the board agrees is a good thing for Roxbury Village School, then he would recommend using fund balance to do it or put it off till next budget season and put it into the budget. So that entail us, because um, if we're contributing to a pot, that sounds a lot like fundraising as opposed to um, just building and, it. On and one of, of the things we talked in the finance committee <clears throat> was that um, it's not clear yet mm -hmm. how much you really want from us. Well, it's the amount is probably the least it, around 10,000 is what um, I've been quoted on putting a concrete pad on enough support underneath it to. I think one of the so challenges one of the is, things is that that land out there is uh, it's very soft. wet yep. mm -hmm. and in the spring is a is a pond. <laughs> <laughs> well, this area, the area that we chose is the highest point and it's not in the back fence area of 20 feet where it floods. What I was going to say yeah. was, if, if one of the things we talked about is if they were further along in the process so mm -hmm. that we knew how much was raised, it might be more reasonable. Mm -hmm. also, so are you also, are you saying that you don't want us to fundraise at the town meeting? I was saying it's up for the board to discuss okay. whether or not they would want to pay for this outright or you'd want to fundraise, okay. or you'd want to say, no, we don't think that's a good, good idea for the property. Okay. Oh. Michelle. Um, if we were going to fundraise, I would think it should be Pi that should fundraise, and the money should go into there, maybe. So another consideration. Um, but the other thing is there is a, um, there's a grant program at, through the state specifically for playgrounds and a grant of this size is an excellent candidate for that mm -hmm. program. It would mean that you couldn't build it until 2021, I think, because mm -hmm. I think the <coughs> applications are doing the fall. Mm -hmm. But um, okay. that's an option for that we weren't aware getting it also. paid for. Okay. Yeah, land, it's called the Land and Water Conservation Fund, and they okay. fund playground improvements. Okay. Okay, I was, I was kind of hoping, though, that originally my concept was that, you know, the community, the town, the community members, and the school would all work together to f achieve something visible and successful and bring the town together, is, is what, I, you know, that if everyone contributes something to it, they own it more. And, um, and I think... Roxbury as a community that has several factions needs to feel that they're working towards something that that the whole community can use. It's a nice idea since this is a, both a town and a school right. facility. Yeah. So um, that's my question to you is to consider that and will you let us know what you decide your your approach would be. I have a question. Yes. Um, so on the on the 10,000 number, yes. was that as a result of some like three quotes or? Oh, no, it was quote? just actually, I think, Grant, uh, no, it was um, Andrew. Andrew mentioned that might be the amount that it would come okay. to. And I think I did ask one other person and they thought I it was in that range. I think you could do it for less, actually. It would be lovely. And we have some really great engineers in town. Okay. So we might be able to um, get some pro bono 
That would be work lovely. As yeah. well. So, you know, I think... I just did a barn foundation, yeah. so it was 8000 okay. and that's a lot bigger. Oh, yes. So okay. Well, you know, the more people we can get to feel that it's worth doing, that, you know, whatever way they can help will say a lot to the community. Bridget. Yeah, I just want to yes. um, speak to the fundraising issue, yeah. because I hear what you're saying, that having the community right. come together, mm -hmm. and I, I see that um, the way that could be a positive thing. Mm -hmm. I do think there's some legal concerns around mm -hmm. fundraising, that's and Michelle's, yeah, so that sounds like what Grant was saying, yep. because I, I don't know who would be doing the fundraising. If the parents group, we can't tell the parents group, which is PI, mm -hmm. to fundraise, but right. they can choose to fundraise right. as the parents group, which is its own nonprofit. Mm -hmm. and then give the money to the district for some purpose. But I would share, I think, Grant's concern legally about the school district itself mm -hmm. conducting a fundraiser. Um, and also this, the suggestion that there would be um, like gift, like a donation bricks or gift bricks that are personalized raise, yeah, raises some significant concerns okay. for a public entity to advertise. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, advertising, just those, personalized messages, you don't know what, yeah. To, yeah. Those are usually cost more than you get from them. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. <laughs> you know, somebody has like you're speaking that, and I, I did investigate, and, you know, each one was at least 10 or $15, and if someone contributes 25 you know, it's probably not worth doing that. And then there's maintenance challenges and so forth. Mm -hmm. That was the other question that Andrew yeah. and Grant were speaking to this morning is is uh, when you build any kind of structure on you know, there's maintenance yeah. there's maintenance afterwards. So there would be we you would be agreeing to cost from here on out to the mm -hmm. So well, I think a good. shade structure is a great idea and we should build one and maintain one. Yay. So then but we should then. we should do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Bridget Grant's real concern wasn't so much the fundraising component as mm -hmm. it was the construction component. Right. He said he just seen so many horror stories of we have everybody and their brother come together and build something. Yeah, well, no, this is but, this is coming this is, from a right. company mm -hmm. that they they make their business by building gazebos. They put the pieces on a truck. They drive it up from Pennsylvania, attach it to your foundation, and in one day it's done. And I've worked with a company in Pennsylvania before, not this one, who came and erected a gazebo at the top of a hill. And they carried all the pieces up the hill. And it was done by evening. And it's just so much simpler than trying to, I mean, it's wonderful if you can get everybody working together and construct it. But that's too complicated for this project. We need it to be, you know, here's what we want. Here's where we want to put it. Let's all get together and make sure we have enough money to have it happen and put it there. And then we can start using it, you know, in the summer. So, Michelle. Do we know how much that nest structure cost at Union? Not that we want to replicate the nest structure, but a simpler structure. <clears throat> Did Norwich donate that, or did they we donate the time to build, build to, to design, design, to design it? But we paid for the materials. I think so. Yeah. It was, so like a, huh. it was, it was built before I out. was hired, <laughs> so I'm not positive. Because that's another option would be a Norwich design build. And this, this company guarantees their work, and it has 30-year guaranteed shingles on it. And it's cedar, so it's not going to rot like some things will. Mm -hmm. um, so you know the the maintenance is is minimal on it. So what do we want to do? We want to maybe have? Well, let's open it up for discussion. But sure. I'm not sure we need to make a decision tonight. Yeah, it's feeling like we could just make a gesture of direction without committing to maybe a dollar amount, um, might be a reasonable enough conclusion at this point in time. Mm -hmm. um, you might wait to see how much money they get at town meeting. Right, and what the actual costs are, and, um, but like I said, I, mean, I would feel happy in supporting the project in general, um, but yeah. for sure I'd like to see it happen. I'm mm -hmm. not quite, we got kind of pinched time-wise, and mm -hmm. um, not knowing total exact numbers makes it a little bit tricky to say we should, this amount, but okay. Well, the amount the amount of the uh, foundation is the <coughs> amount. 
the other is, again, it was from a quote from the company, delivered and assembled. Seems like the big unknown on this is the, the civil engineering on the, on the site drainage mm -hmm. and whether or not, just by moving it to the highest point, whether that really mm -hmm. is the solution. Mm -hmm. from a site-wide problem at because the mm -hmm. site has problems oh yeah so i mean that there, there can be a lot of money spent as we've determined right. as we've discovered in I inside engineering yeah. yeah and so it's not it's not that it you're wrong it's that that i think we would have to do due diligence on that sure yeah no that makes sense does, does it need yeah, a permit do. There is no no yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So I think you you know whoever did the the foundation would have to make sure they knew where they were placing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, then then there might be you know the need to actually do drainage to make sure that right. Water. Could we maybe get some quotes on that? I mean, is it too small to trigger Act 250? Educational institutions are de facto not well, it's subject not ten, it's to town. Not ten acres or okay, even unless, for so unless you want to really, yeah. No, I just want a really big gazebo. I know that they <laughs> <laughs> educational institutions, even if, even if there is town permitting, are often exempt from town permitting. And they go directly to state permitting. So I didn't know if that would just trigger it just like that. I don't think so. I mean, okay. If there's an existing Act 250 permit on the property, then. Mm -hmm. excuse me, right. yeah, it would reopen it, right? right. Yeah, it but would I wouldn't think there would no. be. So they doubled the size of the building in the 90s, um, mm -hmm. but I've never heard in any conversations I've heard about the additions that have been put on. Act 250 has never been raised in any of those conversations. Again, I don't know that for sure, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. Act 250 has never popped up in any conversations about previous work and enlargements on the building. How big is the grounds? Because it might, this might be too small for Act 250. How much I property mean, is this? Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's 10, 10 acres. acres yeah. 10 yeah. acres or 10 subdivisions. Yeah, yeah. Less, than yeah. Acres. It's less than that. Yeah. yeah. So. So what do folks want to do? I want to try well, to get. It sounds a like few they, more. Need, they need a decision quite quickly on the question of whether or not anyone can fundraise under any guise at town meeting. Right. Yeah, the selectmen told me to do that. The selectmen told, told me to do that to after I showed them the information. Right. They said, you know, they said they said the library does it. You should do it too. And they've raised five thousand dollars, right? Mm -hmm. Do I understand yes. that correctly? Fundraising already. And where does that money reside? Is it with the Actually, it's really? my contribution to it. So I, ha I will put it in when other people put money in. Gotcha. And whatever uh, entity we need to decide, that hasn't been decided yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, thank you for doing that. Um, yeah. Sounds like questions need to be yeah, I think we need enumerated so they can be resolved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Like what does the board need answers to? About the I would just say, like, is there anything legally we should consider before because I don't know. Well, I think we have to decide whether we're authorizing someone to go fundraise money for the district. Like the district is sitting at the table saying give money to the district or this is just a group that's either a yeah, parents original, group or something like that. It's like we're the PTO is doing it. Yeah, how does the, in which case, they don't really need our permission. The district, the district owns the property now. It used to mm -hmm. be that the right. school properties were owned by the municipalities, but now it's the district that owns the property. Mm -hmm. So it's up to us to make the decision about whether this happens. Right. Yes. Right. right. Yeah. Structurally. Yeah. How was money raised for the playground? Because there was a fair amount of the parents group. The parents group, which was not. Um, smooth. Well, it was, it was not smooth, not but also smooth. parents group wasn't real. It was, it was not an organization. It didn't have. Um, it didn't have like a. Plus, it started with right. So now, now we have a formal nonprofit. So, for instance, at, at town meeting, if people are writing checks, they can write they a check would, to we would buy town pie, meeting, yeah. and we pie would need could, to know then they it would be tax to deductible. To make the checks to mm -hmm. right, and yeah. and it might be a good example if I'm not mistaken. The original intent of starting that playground was, you know, no problem. We'll do this little. Little thing. Yeah. Yeah. And it turned out to be, as you talked thing. about, a big yeah. problem as far as the land and the structure, which 
we don't know. It could conceivably be the same thing this time. And we started with a grant from the Land Water <laughs> Conservation Fund to build that, that playground, big, huh? and then the parents were trying to raise money to match that, but then the project was so much bigger. Mm -hmm. Which you can have. So I love that the UCF grant looks like something that like cover the whole cost? No, it requires a match. From the district or just a match? Just a match. Aren't there doesn't really matter. two questions here? The first one is whether the, the district would be interested in, if it was, if, it, if all the money came into the district as donations, whether it would be, the district would be interested in building it and having, host, uh, having it on the property. And then the second question is, would the district contribute to the property or should it do all of it? But the finance, who pays is, is separate from whether the district says it. yes or no, mm -hmm. the gazebo is a good idea mm -hmm. and we should allow it effectively if the money works. You know, if the money works, would the district like it? Because if that's a yes, then the next question is simply, how is it paid for? Mm -hmm. Who pays? <clears throat> I, mean, I think if the district would like it, the district should pay for it, but the district would also certainly welcome community contributions by a pie, unless Grant has a real concern about it. No, Maybe I think pie would be would very much a different scenario than mm -hmm. um, fundraising a large portion of it. How so would, wait, how would pie be different? Because what Grant was, then they could say, we're going to give you this much amount. Right. 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 And it, what he was saying is if it's an independent fundraiser, is that, so Dottie goes out and she tries to fundraise $25,000. Let's say that's the, the actual number, but she can only raise um, $15,000 mm -hmm. um, in year one. So is the project on hold? Do we build it? Do we order it and pay the rest of it and then hope the rest of the fundraising comes in? It gets really tricky with like, what if you can never get to $25,000, but you get to $20,000, right? You can't really, so and Grant was saying it's just, the it's just really yeah. tricky around that and who's made, he would much rather have it either we're not building it or the district is building it, and the district is using yeah, district right. money to build it. But could but the board could, be disappointed? Could we do a hybrid in which the district decides to build it, Andrew's in charge of getting site engineering, site design. Oh, yeah, he will that, be doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. District is going to build it. District is going to control the sitch, but we welcome community well, contribution. Can we take this approach? Can we say the district would like to build it? The district would like to go out and see what the cost of building it is because we're a little, we have some questions about the so, grounds and the yeah. site. And if it's a reasonable cost, we'll go forward. And if it turns out that there's, you know, a huge drainage problem or some other issue that <laughs> we anticipated that might send the cost through the roof, we'll rethink it. So the, the, so I propose that. Um, we might approve finding out how much it would cost as yeah. the first step. So, so we want Andrew to study this and Andrew to, Andrew to bring up get the proposal. A, yeah. What's required to do this? And then the board can decide because, you know, my rec my wish would have been that it's in a budget, if not yeah. this one. If we're paying for the whole thing, then mm -hmm. the next one. But at least then we'd know how much it costs. And would it be possible for us to say, We'll fund it, and we want a match from the community. Like we'll do, like half and half. Would, would that be possible or not? Because that, that would give you the, the community the ownership. What if they don't get it? What if the community doesn't make that money? I think that requires a really clear board resolution yeah. that the, that we shall not do anything beyond pre-development until all funding is in place, effectively. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so whether that we decide that's going to be private funding or public funding or a combination of them. We do the pre-development, we get our price tag, and we stop. And we don't schedule it, we don't hire people, we don't order materials, we don't order contractors, we don't sign contracts. And who would be responsible for don't know. Um, I guess a no continuation more. of the process at that point in time? Well, no, but the build? No, just or the to pull the money together. Sure. Right. I mean, well, you could decide again, couldn't we get the estimate on how much it would cost to actually do it, uh -huh. and then it comes back to the board, and you then, know, then it says, oh, it's only going to cost $5,000 to put this on, or 
oh, there's lots of drainage problems and it's going to cost $50,000, does the board still want to do it? So it comes back at that point to the board, and then you decide whether you really want to do it or not. Well, and then you could discuss the how. I mean, the, the issue with, with fundraising is if you have people who make a bunch of pledges and you don't collect it, then if, it doesn't, if you don't get the number, you can quit. But if you... Yeah, you know, if you're taking a bunch of checks and it gets mingled, and you have you know organizations that aren't super straight, and like a bunch of people have written you know forty dollars checks or given forty dollars in cash, and we don't get to the number, and then people are like, well, I gave my forty dollars to this gazebo, where is it? Where is it? Mm -hmm. And then we say, well, we're not billing because we don't have money, and then they say, well, where's my forty dollars? We're like, well, we don't know. Um, well, no, certainly before any yeah. <laughs> funds were collected, there needs to be a source to deposit yeah. them in and a record of who gave what. So if they have to be returned, and it's possible to do, that. to do that. Yeah. It sounds to me like fundraising on town meeting day, given that it's a month away, that doesn't seem like a thing to go forward with at the moment. Just since that's a separate question of all the other questions. I would disagree with you because the, the impetus right now is for town meeting to be the place in the community that that's their time frame. I just mean, like, yeah. time frames of the project doesn't right. allow for that time frame, mm -hmm. sounds like. Dottie, the article, yeah. the, the petition, the petition yeah. that circulated, yes. the and article would have asked it. for X amount of dollars. It would have asked for 10000 To go to who? Do you remember? How was it? It was just to the project. I don't, I didn't do it. I think Anna actually had the petition. The language. Yeah. Okay. So she would have So it that. didn't say it's going to Merp's by? Because I, I would have had to assume that that's where... I don't know, because I didn't do what she was doing, that part of it. And she supposedly has contacted everybody who had signed it, expecting it to be on the town meeting warrant, and told them that we were now, because of the selectman's decision, that we were going to do it as a, um, an informational table and collect funds at town meeting day because we would have access to more people at that time. I mean, we can't tell Merp Spy not to do a fundraiser. No. Um, we don't have any authority over what they do and don't do. Um, so I, I mean, technically they're a separate institution doing whatever they want to do, so. So, um, I mean, I guess my thought is let's have Andrew investigate. Um, if separate fundraising wants to occur, it can occur, but at this point, it can't occur with, I think, until we get some sort of guarantee about how the district feels and what the cost is. Um, but I think you can tell me the board is interested in considering it. We just want to find out okay. the costs okay. and, you know. Well, the fundraising yeah. should not be for the district, is what I'm saying. No. Sure. The, check, the say check should not be written out. No, the check should not be written out. For, yes, for the community's contribution. Exactly. In some way. In some yeah. way, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but it should not be right. money given to the district. No. Um, but I think having Andrew look at it and see what the price tag is and, um, you know, if it's, if it's reasonable, hopefully we can just, you know, whatever fundraise is fundraise and the district can pick up the rest and make it happen. And if it's, you know, if there's unanticipated problems and it's really expensive, then we'll have to figure out from there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Well, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you yeah, very much. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dottie. Um, thanks for having me tonight. My name is uh, Matt McLean, and I have the, well, first off, thanks to each of you for just all the service to the school community. It uh, reminds me driving down here. Um, from Worcester all the time and effort you put in. So I just wanted to just genuinely appreciate that. Um, walking back to 1998, I was an intern um, at Montpelier High School in Social Studies and had the really good fortune to be hired as a part-time teacher um, in 1999. And just really, again, thanks for the opportunity to, to be connected with the school community and thanks for, yeah, just all that you're doing. Really appreciate it. Um, we appreciate you. Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Yeah. Uh, I want to, uh, three, kind of three goals for just sharing information tonight. One is to share and inform uh, the board or inform additionally uh, the board about flexible pathways. Um, share some target areas that are kind of like lenses through which we're looking at our work um, so that we're kind of keeping an eye on equity so that all means all um, in terms of our our students that are accessing um, flexible pathways. 
and just to identify some of the growing needs and, and priority areas as we just kind of move forward. So it's really, it's an information share, um, and hopefully there's enough information that can prompt some questions, um, whether it's tonight or additionally down the road. We'd welcome the dialogue about a lot of the stuff that's happening, which is a lot of moving parts, which is, when it's, it's cool, it's fun. Before we get going, I'm gonna just ask, please, um, and thanks for indulging me in this. Um, can you take about 60 to 90 <coughs> seconds? This is kind of a rapid fire. Um, and do some, yeah. if you can think about something that you have chosen to learn in your life, something that you chose to learn about, who was there to support you in that learning? And what was a skill that helped you in that learning process? So just in your life, just something you, cho you chose to, to learn about. It could be anything. Um, who was there to support you in that? And what was a skill that was important for you in that learning experience? Tears on the response, so <laughs> to get out ahead of it. What was the last piece of that skill piece? What, what, what skill allowed you to access or engage in that learning experience? Question is, you know, what's something you chose to learn about? Who was there to support you in that? And what was a skill that helped you to access that learning experience? Would anyone be willing to share what that learning experience was? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Um, actually. Uh, when I became a principal, it was um, what supported me. The first question was, what was there to support me? Yeah, who or yeah. who or what? Because it was one of those things that when I got my first job, I thought nobody told me this, and <laughs> it wasn't in the program. <laughs> and it was the other principals in the district that were very supportive because they'd been there mm. to say to me. Yep, I know that. Nope, you're not going to do that right the first time kind of thing, and that was good. And the skills maybe re directly related to that was I, in all the confusion of that first year, I had to be able to listen yeah. <laughs> to those people that talked to me about it and maybe be concise about uh, focusing what I needed to know and what they could help me with. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Awesome. Anyone else? Um, so I decided to start learning Russian. Um, and uh, the support there was really that uh, the infrastructure for language, language learning is different than it used to be. And so the independent infrastructure of apps and things so that I could choose to engage independently without having to have a teacher or something like that, um, that support was available. And then, um, the, the skill that I needed to make that happen, though, was um, kind of an, like an understanding of what was going to be sustainable as an independent learner um, in terms of like how often I would engage or, or what goals I would have to set for myself. And those are skills that I had learned before in other things in school and things. But the, 
the cho- the the skill of choosing pacing and capacity. I think. Awesome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Here, one more. So, um. I learned how to fly airplanes. Cool. Sorry. Hey, okay. <laughs> don't do that. What? Good <laughs> <laughs> question. <laughs> and um, there was a guy named Pat, and we had a, a we had a, a mutual love of music. We both played in bands and things, and he was an excellent pilot. And so he really kind of took me under his wing. It can be a little intimidating at the airfield. And I would say he taught me confidence, you know, to know, to be able to uh, do my solo and and all that. So, yeah. Awesome. Confidence was key. <laughs> yeah. Are you flying still? I have not been flying lately, no. But I had... My best year, I had 78 flights. Awesome. Wow. So, Matthew, you may not set up a flexible pathway with Jerry. <laughs> 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 oh, definitely have a student. I know. The fields are dirty. Warning for the return of We need air traffic controllers. You have to be yeah. a pilot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Um, thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, probably obvious where I'm heading with this. It's just, there's so many opportunities um, to engage in learning. Um, and when we think about, you know, what the, what our overall mission is, you know, within the schools, you know, we want to, we want caring, creative, equitable communities and, you know, that build in children's talents and passions and continue to promote them as lifelong learners. And I, and I think that that's, in my mind, that is Flexible Pathways offers a way, amongst many ways, uh, within the learning community to promote and support uh, the mission, um, where students have voice and choice. Um, I, was, when I just took a tour of Dottie's classroom, and she was talking about this amazing new voice and choice piece that she has with her preschoolers. And she didn't know what we were talking about tonight. And she's like, it's just unbelievable the engagement that, that her students have when they're able to have some choice and, um, and agency in that. So it's, it's, it's cool from a, from a system from pre-K all the way through graduation, how do, we, how do we encourage young people to think about their interests and their passions and their skills and their aspirations? And so, and then to, what do we do with that? So anyhow, um, I wanna just point some, so I'm, I apologize if I'm gonna yabber. So please interrupt um, as we go along and certainly obviously questions um, at the end would be, would be welcome. But um, just to kind of point the attention to Act 77 from 2013, really it was a mandate for all um, schools in Vermont to create flexible pathways to learning and to graduation. And so this, this is, it's, well, it's our locally uh, adopted uh, framework. We're, we're also doing this because all schools in Vermont are being asked to do this work. Um, you know, developing and, and expanding high quality educational experiences, promoting opportunities for students to achieve secondary readiness and really like honing in what are the skills regardless of what path the student takes when they graduate, what are the skills that they need um, to move in that aspirational direction. And then this idea of, you know, making sure that, that, that we're, we're looking to increase secondary high school completion and post-secondary school continuation, whether that's post-secondary training, two years, associate's degree, four-year degree, whatever that is. Those are some of the main aims that the state legislature um, adopted as, as they put forth Act 77. And so that's partly what you know, we're, we're, we're charged to do and we're happy to do. Um, just to kind of orient you to, to the different pathways uh, at the high school, um, just kind of listen. I'll, I'll, I'll touch on some of these um, additionally, but I just wanted to just kind of list them out. So community-based learning is, is one of the, the longest standing um, pathways, and it's, it's I'll, I'll talk more about it, but it's, it's really students engaging in community learning experiences, often with mentors um, in an area of personal interest. Personalized learning studies, it was kind of renamed last year, it was called independent studies. Um, and really wanted to kind of reframe the idea of like, it's just an independent thing. We're going to increase this idea of collaboration of, of learning with adults and students collaborating in the design 
of learning. Uh, online learning, just driving down here, VT, VLC, uh, Vermont Virtual uh, Learning Cooperative is, you know, you'll hear it on a lot of different radio stations. They're, it's just a growing higher ed focus uh, from a fiscal standpoint, from a learning platform standpoint, and it's a growing uh, element uh, in Vermont high schools and one that's keeping us kind of on our toes trying to understand what it is. It's, it's, it's an interesting dynamic that we're learning about uh, every day with every student experience. And then dual enrollment in early college, again, affording all juniors and seniors uh, in high school the opportunity to uh, uh, dip their toes in or immerse, uh, as early college uh, does, in higher ed um, as part of their high school education. The Central Vermont Career Center, uh, located on the Spalding uh, campus, and our extended learning opportunities, which are uh, learning opportunities that are really specifically focused on our learning expectations and the transferable skills. And then we have a partnership with uh, Central Vermont Adult Basic Education, the high school completion program. And that's oftentimes a hybrid of students accessing uh, opportunities at the high school and also accessing opportunities that they would have with um, Adult Basic Ed and create a learning plan. Can I ask you, yeah. uh, the ELOs confuse me sometimes because I, I always kind of imagine that being integrated into each of the other pathways, but I, I just don't understand the mechanics of it all. And like the personalized learning study and the ELOs, they seem, they overlap to me and I don't, I'm sure they're different paths, but I don't really get why you need an ELO if you've got all these other things. Yes. <laughs> Excellent confusion or question. <laughs> totally. That, and we're, we're realizing that. ELOs is, I mean, that's, that's the thing that interwo interweaves between so many different learning experiences, including classroom experiences. All, all classes that the high school have transferable skills that are attached to them where there are formative and summative assessment instruction around those skills. And the same is true of, you know, online learning or personalized learning studies, community-based learning. Really the the transferable skills are embedded within them. Um, if a student really wanted to do, it, it, it's also a way to just kind of bridge, like a student did an ELO in, um, he's a, a dishwasher at Mad Taco. And his skill that he identified was persistence. And around washing dishes, he set a goal for, you know, making enough money so he could buy a drum kit. So, but it wasn't like a personalized learning study, it wasn't a community-based learning, it was just something he was doing naturally. And he wanted to say, hey, Montpelier High School, please value what I'm doing at my work. And by the way, it's connected to the skills that you're asking me to graduate with um, as part of my graduation. It's, it's one of those skills. So, so Steve, yeah, they, they, are, they are woven in. Um, and my sense is that ELOs as a pathway may just get enveloped into all the other ones. But yeah, there's a, there's a good question. Um, we have a current team. Um, uh, the, a position was newly created last year. Uh, I had the good fortune of applying and, and getting it as an administrative position as a director of the, of the team. Um, Stephanie Delina um, is the longest standing faculty member uh, on the team and Sarah Loveless and Kiana Bromley are the two faculty community-based learning advisors. And Bill Laidlaw is, a f is split halfway. 50% of his position is a community-based learning advisor, and 50% of his, his position is uh, special ed funded. And he has students uh, as a caseload. He case manages a couple students. And so he's, he's got kind of two discrete uh, jobs, but affords a, a level of expertise within our department that allows us to really think about how do we best support all students and their ability to access these these opportunities and kind of brings that that lens continually to the to the work and the conversation and then we have a uh, an instructional uh, assistant katrina phillips amazing I and mean, all these uh, uh, colleagues are amazing and Katrina uh, focuses on supporting students directly in the community with uh, the most significant barriers to accessing opportunities. And so she's there really supporting students, mostly with developmental disabilities uh, in their, in their community-based learning experiences. And then we have different um, content uh, faculty members 
who support students who are doing studies in the content areas, whether it's English language arts or global citizenship or the science, technology, math, and engineering. And so we've got three, 3.5 faculty that are dedicated kind of purely at a big chunk of the Flexible Pathways work, an instructional assistant, and then my position as an administrator. So that's kind of the team. And to be fair, you do many more things than just Flexible Pathways. Yes. <laughs> many more things. <laughs> All fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, and again, I, time is short. I'm not going to, you know, blah, blah, blah. But so community-based learning, um, there's three different types. Work-based learning, kind of your traditional internship. Um, student goes, they work with an architect, an environmental engineer, an auto mechanic, and really kind of learning a trade or a profession kind of in that kind of traditional sense. Community-based personal study, those are um, studies that a student might pursue in um, jazz piano, or pottery, they don't necessarily want to be a potter, but, but they really want to have that artistic creative element as part of their learning experience during whatever semester. So it's not really that traditional internship, but it's a, just a personal learning study that they're really um, kind of identifying and wanting support in accessing along the way. And then service-based activities, students that you know, want to um, work at uh, Heaton Woods, uh, or they want to work at the elementary school, working in, as a classroom assistant because it just is good to get out of the school and to go and be in a very different you know, learning environment, supporting kids. I mean, there's any number of, and the big tent is community-based learning, and then we're really trying to understand where students are trying, what's their entry point to wanting to leave school to access other learning opportunities that are community-supported. Um. Kind of going back to Steve's question, just because I had an example come to mind and I want to check yeah. that that's what you're talking about. Yeah. So I've had a kid do a CBL and that's a structured formal thing with a set duration and check-ins with you and so forth. And I had a kid do independent study, which is a semester long with check-ins with the teacher and stuff and so forth, also formal and structured. And, but in ELO, could that be like, um, you know, so well, my daughter does the conversation. Yeah. If she does a presentation at a conference, and I mean, they have a lot of opportunities to do presentations, but if for some reason they didn't, and that was a skill that she wanted to demonstrate, could that be an opportunity that she identified, like with Lissa or something, to get credit for? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and it would be. Yes, is a short answer. Okay. Um, it's and ELOs right now are, are funneled through TAs, um, so that it's a way for TAs to also get to know their students and what their interests are, and to be able to support them in that skill development through the PLP process. Is that something that she would identify with her TA and the yeah. PLP? Yeah, but but Lisa would be kind of the primary supporter of that work, um, and then that would go back to, to, through the PLP and the TA, who's the main supporter of that. Yes. Okay. Cool. So they can identify that kind of, if they're building a skill in a sort of one-off way, yeah. they could, as long as they talk with somebody about it, it might be an opportunity. Yeah, and there's, there's, there's some reflection, there's some prompts. Um, sure. just, yeah. yeah. Verification and accountability and all of that. Yes, but less structured than, say, a, a community-based learning experience. But yes, there is a structure and expectations within that. Right. Then I'm curious, Relis that's in front of us right now has a bunch of careers that you might have traditionally found in a tech center. Mm -hmm. Some of those, um, like culinary arts, the furniture making, nursing, that stuff would still be found in tech centers. Are we somehow recreating the same opportunities as a tech center, or how are we, how would a CBL experience in nursing differ from, say, maybe in a like the tech center, Barry or Randolph or wherever? You know, I think it's 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 the scale of the experience. You know, some students really want to do a deep dive, which is a you know, if you commit to the you know the career center, you're really committing quite a significant amount of time during any given year to that particular focus. Whereas somebody said they're a junior and they're thinking about what they might want to do after high school, and they're like nursing seems cool. Like my mom's a nurse, my friend's a nurse, so they're able to have that experience during their semester 
that is also complemented by any number of courses that they would just take in-house. So they can take a number of different courses and then they would sign out, they'd go up, they'd go wherever they would go to work with a nurse. So it's, it's not displacing a student from going to the career center, it's actually encouraging, potentially could encourage a student like let's use automotive technology. A student did uh, community-based learning at Utton's Automotive with Keith Brown, got completely jazzed about it, applied, this is a true example, but applied junior year to uh, the Career Center, did, no, senior year to the Career Center, did a senior year there in automotive technology and is now a freshman um, at VTC in their automotive program. And so it really, it, it, students can kind of test the waters a little bit, and then if they want to make that bigger jump, into anything, then and if the career center has that, they're they're then able to make that decision. So really, it's also it's also a place for them to launch ideas, as well. I I did maybe not the same one, but I did speak to a student who went to Utton's, learned to do things, and said I had no idea that the tech center was there. That wasn't why I had signed up. And then when I learned and I wanted to learn more, there it was. Yeah, I'll just kind of address that one, you know, down the road, but. Do students know about the Career Center? Right? And so like, that's, that's another important question to ask, for sure. So yeah. maybe just a comment, and I'm sorry, I don't, want, I don't mean to be negative no. or anything, but um, are we considering that some of these jobs won't be around? I mean, we, if even I talked to recently to somebody who completed the automotive and came to that realization as well. I mean, a lot of it is just diagnosing with a computer, it's not with the newer cars. I mean, are we just considering some of the future careers that will be available? At the Career Center? Just in general, like to try to encourage people not to go down a dead-end path. I mean, because Vermont, when I see Vermont, I see a lot of, uh, it, it seems to be behind. Yeah. Quite a quite quite a bit in some areas, and so I worry that uh, the the kids don't really have the skill sets needed for the future. Yeah, um, good question. I think well, just focusing on the career center, and this is true all, all of the state. Career centers are really closely connected with the Department of Labor, and really looking at like where are the trends of need within industries and they're really working to be responsive to those labor trends um, that are shifting um, certainly i mean the last two addresses that governor scott did um, were both really about jobs and young people staying to do the jobs and, and what's available so so career centers are, are are really working to be responsive in their programs for that with with community-based learning, it is less about like what career will you do. It's it's about that. But you know, 15, 16 years old, the the proficiency in this course is self-awareness and responsibility. And so the content of the course is not nursing or midwifery. The content of the course is the student themselves. And so because the content proficiency is self-awareness, that's the content. The vehicle to understand themselves and their skills and their aspirations is the experience itself in the community with a mentor. And so it's just, it's just kind of flipping it like from like, yeah, here's what career do you want to do when I'm 15 or 16? That's, that's hard. Some students know, some students don't. But every student has the ability to have a facilitated opportunity to just the iterative process of reflection. So excellent. My, my daughter did a CBL in an office, and she got to do some very cool stuff. But I think one of the biggest realizations was, so when you work in an office, you sit at a desk all day. <laughs> like, all day. <laughs> and then, yeah. That's pretty, it's that's an important pretty realization. And yeah. both of her parents work in an office, so she has, you know, an idea, but... To experience yeah. it and understand just at that basic level. Yeah. So much, so much of it is hard telling, not knowing. You know, you get out and you're like, I don't know, maybe. You know, like I might be interested in that, or that might be relevant job. But it's really just about 
it's more about skills and and just self awareness. That's really what it's about. And if yeah, and finding out what you don't want to do. Yeah, like sitting in office. Like sitting <laughs> yeah, totally. For instance. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, that that makes sense. Learning how to learn. Yeah, and in, and engage thoughtfully in a community and civic context. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so as, as a parent, you know, hundreds of community partners, the school community relationships that are um, are born and sustained over time is, is absolutely amazing. Uh, we, we can't do enough as a school community to thank our, our community partners every single year. There's hundreds of, of adult mentors who reach out and accept invitations to work with students. It's amazing. And so I just wanted just to kind of point to that as the backbone, because without them, these experiences cannot be facilitated, and that, that learning is just is stymied. Um, online learning, it's, 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 it's one of the uh, Act 77's kind of platforms uh, and, path, and pathways. We're learning a lot about what uh, student needs are around online learning. Some of our partners are Vermont Virtual Learning Cooperative, VTVLC, which is kind of most closely aligned with the Agency of Ed um, as an online partner. And they have their own course of studies. They have semesterized courses. Um, and they also have these on demand, which offers some flexibility of when students start the course and when it ends. Virtual high school, very significant like, national uh, online provider. eAchieve uh, is Wisconsin's uh, state online school. Um, both Hope Petraro, your board members Hope, and Eve both. <coughs> Uh, have taken or are taking uh, French courses through EHE French 4 because uh, those that particular level of French is not offered in the other schools um, and because it's a singleton there was there was scheduling issues they just they couldn't they couldn't take French 4 because it bumped into something else with a singleton so that's in their cases that's partly why they chose an online course is they could not access that course because they had something else that was also offered at that same time, and they had to make a choice. So this offered some flexibility for them to continue with their French studies um, and not have to just give it up. Um, and then obviously, you know, the Russian or whatever, there's, there's all sorts of things that students can, the, the program of study blows open pretty significantly with online courses, uh, for sure. I want to thank you for that because been one of my bugaboos and we really have raised the number of kids that are doing online courses and online courses are not necessarily easy to do and so mm -hmm. the support that you've been giving students is good because you can do things we can't offer or can't afford to offer. Yes, <clears throat> with those partnerships, with those right. virtual, yeah. And we're still learning how to best support that, for sure. Um, and so part of that is, is asking students, this was just 13 responses, this was this last year, just trying to get some feedback. From like, well, what are you bumping into? What, you know, what skills are you finding are, are useful? Um, and time management, and there could be another you know, two or three different pie charts, keeps coming back um, as just kind of you were referring to that in your own you know, Russian studies, mm -hmm. how do I prioritize my time? And so really working with students uh, and school counselors to really Kind of identify like when will you do this? You, it's a dedicated time, um, and we're learning with every student experience how to best or better facilitate that. And I know certainly Eleanor had her own experiences with that. Don't don't imagine you'll get it done over the summer. <laughs> no, and yeah, yeah. So we're we're learning every day about. You will not. <laughs> no, I've, and we actually stopped offering online courses over the summer because. Anyhow, yeah, because yeah. they're not supported, <laughs> and we found the students just. And it's, it's lonely to do a course all by yourself, sitting in a computer, and nobody to talk to, unless you have somebody that's going to ask you how you're doing. Yeah, and there are, there's virtual instructors, but again, there's not. It's not that mm -hmm. yeah. side by side. How do you piece. judge? Or how do you, you know, have metrics for success of the program on online learning? I mean, I would imagine those who complete satisfactorily might be one of those things. Um, are, and if you do keep those sorts of records, like how are you seeing it changing? Yeah. Are you effective? We've yet to collect that data, Steve. Right? And that's, I think, part of the role of bringing in a director position is really to, to put attention to that. Um, and so 
last year we began to just kind of both both high school and dual enrollment. There's many students who do dual enrollment courses that are online uh, through UVM or CCV or VT or uh, VTC. So yes, their grade is a marker, but I think it's 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 going to be their own experience through an evaluation at the end of the course around, you know, did you feel supported? Did you feel like you, you grew your skills? Like putting their attention back to the skills that they are needing to, to do a course and to journey through it. Almost as if the process is more important than the product, you know, not, not more important, but we want to put their attention back to the process of learning um, in addition to, you know, their achievement in the course itself. So we haven't really set the, the, the markers, but that is a that is in the wheelhouse. I mean, even if you had two markers to start, right? That you yeah. Just use for some longitudinal stuff. And yes. Um, personalized learning studies. These are more content-specific studies, um, and they're supported through uh, faculty who are licensed in in the different areas. And students can choose to do these um, any semester. It's more typical that they do them as, uh, as sophomores, juniors, and seniors. We have two freshmen that are engaged in English language arts, journalism. They were at the State House this morning. Um, we're working with uh, John Walters, who works for VT Digger, looking at doing journalism around climate crises and so they were in one of the house committees this morning at 10 listening to testimony um, and then they'll be writing about that so all sorts of things there's a student that's doing a small engine repair um, because that's what his family has done for generations wants it to be a part of his own experience and so trying to honor that bring that in um, again just trying to being asking students what are the skills that you, this was kind of a pre-assessment before the students, so we have some formative data before we, before we go into working with them, and they have some reflection um, ahead of time to be thinking about what skills they're gonna really be needing to access and grow as part of these experiences. And it gives us a chance to kind of identify which students feel that they're good at setting goals or they have a way of being organized, et cetera, and we kind of, um, organize our support accordingly. Uh, dual enrollment in early college, um, increasing number of students who are accessing uh, both of these really amazing options is at CCV today for an hour, um, just looking at our early college and dual enrollment students before the ad drop, uh, so that if students say they want to do it, but all of a sudden they're like, oh my god, and they haven't been there for two weeks, that we can support them in exiting that experience if that's appropriate for that situation so that they don't get in a situation where they have this this course that's officially transcripted and then follows them you know both part of their high school and their college transcript as their kind of foray into so we're really trying to look at that because a lot of students have never had this experience um, and for those that don't have the prerequisite skills to do it we want to make sure that we're supporting them in being able to access that. Uh, Career Center, lots of different programs. I think the um, uh, question around relevance to modern society and future societies. I, um, yeah, I think a lot of digital media arts is the most popular. Natural resources and sustainability is also very, very popular. Um, and a lot of students are uh, putting their attention. We. This year, next Friday, we're bringing 31 students to the Career Center for interviews and a job shadow, uh, which is the highest number of students we've had applied to the Career Center. We currently have 18 students that are enrolled. And that's high. And then the year before that, we had 11. And so I think the, the, then the question is, like, why is it growing, right? So then that you know begs that question. Um, I think increasingly, students are wanting like really tangible, relevant, learning opportunities that they may not be finding, you know, in their uh, kind of general education experiences. And it's not that it's not there, but they're, I think, increasingly saying, like, I want to have a full immersion in this area. Um, and students cannot matriculate to the Career Center until they're juniors and seniors. There is a sophomore program, but it's really small. And it's, it's only, it's, 10 students for all the different sending towns. So it's, there's not a lot of sophomores. And so we really have them, you know, 
at Montpelier High School for the first couple years, trying to understand who they are who, and what they what they want, and then a lot of them are are wanting to to put their 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 hat in the ring for these programs. But again, Steve, your point, like we want to be better at understanding why are they uh, applying. That's that's an open question, but I think really relevant, tangible, authentic experiences, building a home. Plumbing a house, doing electrical, building websites, doing you know marketing work for companies through digital media arts. Those are those are I think exciting opportunities for students. And I think it's an acceptable thing now at Montpelier High School. And at least when my children went to school here, it wasn't quite an acceptable thing if you wanted to go to the tech center. Yes, it's shifting. Yeah, for sure. And that, and that has to do with families too, because parents certainly hold so much sway over you know what students will be doing and what they won't be doing. And so I think it's it's really both from students and faculty, but also just from a family's perspective. But if the school doesn't value it, then it becomes harder to negotiate going someplace else, coming back, yeah. making sure you've got not missing something of the high school, not missing something of the tech center. Yes. So that's to your credit. Mm -hmm. or, um, we try to avoid, and apologies in time, please keep me unchecked um, on this. So we're putting our attention towards uh, equity, trying to make sure that we're, we're really focused on including all students in our, in our pathways. The lenses through which we're looking at that are just clarity, support, and agency. And, and again, these are just focus areas and they're continued efforts. We're, 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 not, we're not there, and we're, but we know that we need to just continually look at these areas. Just what communications do we have for students, families, and community partners, faculty, and staff? Continual review of processes and procedures through our guidance, um, processes, or external partnerships, whether they're community-based learning mentorships or online or dual enrollment, uh, teacher advisory and special education. You know, how are we how are we working with systems in order to make sure that all students and, and their families and guardians understand what what the opportunity is and how do they access it uh to kind of level that playing field of how do you play the game of school and that's that's something we're we're focused on and then trying to consolidate that all in our flexible pathways handbook um, and being better at promoting that so that families and students know what that what all those pieces are in one place uh support we've the the staff that we had up earlier just tremendously dedicated to this idea that all students should be able to have access. It's hard. Um, it gets clumsy when all students are in the mix, and but the, the staff is dedicated to that. Um, we're constantly, you know, looking at, um, you know, how our, our partnerships uh, with higher ed, our community partners are supportive, again, for all students. Um, our online working with VTVLC to make sure that IEPs are trans are transferred to the teachers, and that we that we have the right agreements in place so that those teachers understand what the learner profile is, so that when they're doing those courses, it's not just like, well, I didn't know. And so, really trying to refine those sorts of partnerships with our, in this case, with our online partners, um, but in any of the partnerships. And then uh, TA and faculty support, teacher advisor uh, and faculty support, really teachers knowing what students are wanting uh, what they're lacking and continuing to provide appropriate supports along the way. And then transportation, kind of a discrete item. Thank you for that support. The, sc the school has uh, some vehicles that we have not had in many, many years and it just uh, affords kids a chance to get places they're not taking vehicles themselves, but right. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have all the keys? Gee, check it out, man. Just don't drive slow. Oh, Jerry's <laughs> <laughs> it's a totally. Oh no. <laughs> um, but that's that's huge, and just I mean, we obviously have a unique situation in town. Other schools don't, so we, that's really unique in that way. Um, but thank you. That's a huge piece. Uh, and an agency, if we're going to ask young people what their interests and in, in, in having some voice and choice, we have to be responsive in ways that we can support them to experience those areas. Um, and we need to have adult supporters to, to support that. In the absence of that, it's, it's undermining the idea of like, who are you, what do you want to be, and what do you need. Um, real quick, just um, there's some numbers. 
Uh, this was from 2018, 2019. Um, there was 358, it was over the course of the entire year, um, 358 supported student experiences, of which 187 were unduplicated. So essentially, many students did multiple experiences. 187 is kind of the individual student that may have done one, one online course and one community-based learning experience. Um, in that year, 43%, um, so of the 187, 29 were eligible for free and reduced lunch. Uh, based on the, the total number of students who were eligible for free and reduced lunch during that year at the high school, 43% um, of free and reduced eligible students participated in a flexible pathway during 2018-19. <coughs> Uh, last year, uh, we grew in the number of total supported experiences and the number of individual experiences, so more kids accessing these opportunities. And our percentage of students who are accessing um, these pathways increased um, to 56% based on uh, this year. It's, I think there's 72 students at the high school who are eligible for free and reduced lunch. 43 of them participated in one of the pathways. And so we're, we're just trying to keep our eye on, on making sure that the students are really, and their families know about these and that they're supported in them. Uh, dual enrollment, and this is come, come to a close, sorry, just to kind of give folks a, kind of a, a landing pad here. Um, dual enrollment early college, is just to kind of like break it down into this piece. We know, well, the state knows um, that there is Students from low SES um, are not accessing dual enrollment in early college to the extent that was originally intended, period. Mm -hmm. That's a statewide issue. Mm -hmm. We know that. Um, and we, again, this is our work moving forward. We need to put our attention to that and to have the right supports in place so that students can be supported in that transitional knowledge, which is a kind of a privileged knowledge. Like, how do I how do I navigate an external like system? Mm -hmm. And not all students have the ability to navigate that. That's a privileged kind of like skill set that many students don't have, uh, just because they haven't been around it, they haven't been taught it. And so, making sure that we're we're identifying students that want this opportunity and supporting them through it. Uh, this is this year, um, so we had 34 students <clears throat> total doing dual enrollment courses and seven doing early college. Uh, this year it's through, we have one at Northern Vermont University, we have three at Norwich and four uh, at CCD. Do they have to fulfill certain requirements in order to be eligible to do that? Like do they have to have gotten to a certain point in their traditional course work book? or they can do dual enrollment, or can? <clears throat> no, no, is the short answer. And any, we, any, senior, any junior or senior can do that? Yes, but it's made in collaboration with school counselors, parents, like not, not every opportunity is appropriate for every student. And mm -hmm. so we look at just content, core content, you know, have you had the math background to take this, mm -hmm. this, this math course, and is it appropriate? Student says, well, I really want to take a dual enrollment course, but I don't have that math, but I'd like to experience that, you know, but I want to take a painting class or a philosophy class or something that's not necessarily kind of discreetly aligned with a, a progression of knowledge, then they can access that through that. So it's a conversation about what knowledge and skills do they have going through the door and what courses might be appropriate in that, in that situation. Um, and we put together kind of three buckets that we look at with star assessment, uh, scores, SBAC testing, um, transferable skills, and just looking at all those markers with students and their families to say, here are a bunch of things that we can look at to say, are you, are you ready so that you, so that you have, so you can be successful? So we're not saying you should not be doing this. We're actually saying the exact opposite. Here's what you need to be thinking about to make an informed choice. Um, enrollment projections, you saw this from uh, Libby and Grant's slide um, presentation, budget presentation in December. As you know, our total enrollment is increasing in the district as it will be at the high school. 
Um, we are turning kids away from opportunities because we don't currently have the ability to absorb the demand um, in our programming. And there's there's waiting lists for each of the each of the, not all the pathways, but community-based learning, online learning, personalized studies. They all have waiting lists because we, we don't have the the ability to staff appropriately the um, supports that are needed for students. And they're all at a pretty significant threshold, but if we're we just gonna grow for growing number, no, because that would be to the disregard of what students, all students need in order to access these, these pathways. Uh, we asked for a 0.5 increase this past budget cycle, um, but given the priorities that were competing across the district, that was not uh, on the table for this year. I will definitely be coming back to um, uh, seek additional support um, so that we're not having to turn kids away. We're turning kids away. We're denying them access to these, these opportunities. And we don't want to just grow the numbers. That's not our, our, our goal. Our goal is to afford as many kids the right support and opportunity as is possible. <clears throat> uh, work ahead, just to finish off. Just continuing our focus on equity, clarity, uh, support, student agency. Just looking at data, just, you know, again, just we're kind of untangling a lot of different things that have been in place to try and pull out the right data so that we have a better sense of who's participating, what's their experience, kind of one of our markers for success, uh, both achievement and more qualitative student experience, and then, well, and then their achievement. Uh, continue to form strong partnerships, um, new pathways. You know, we don't want to stay static in, in what we're currently offering. We want to continue to innovate. Uh, one thing we did this year was WILD, which is the Wilderness Inquiry Leadership Development that Dave Bennett um, leads and, and the connection that Dave has, has made this year with Jerry Tillotson and global citizenship around this, this big idea through the C3 standards, college, career, and civics around inquiry. There's this big idea around inquiry, and this entire piece of WILD is really around inquiry and how that transfers as a global citizen. And then just support and retain the faculty that we have. Um, and if we can, we would, we would love to grow um, in order for student experiences. Yeah. And I think, Anna, you mentioned that you'd be able to share this. And so there's also some resources here to yeah, I apologize. It's kind of like, wow. Well, 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 well. <laughs> I totally apologize about that. But so, but so questions that you may have um, about this. I, I just want to say, first of all, thank you so much. Um, you used uh, the term or the lens of of privilege there near the end, which I think, you know, we all talk about that a little bit now, but I think we only talk about it more, but when you, you were having us do these things, I had a hard time with the skill. I had an easy time with the, what was the privilege I had to get me to that point, right? Yeah. Like, whatever it might be, you know, learning to play piano or whatever, some privilege behind that. And when you were talking about the, the issues around um, dual enrollment and such, um, it really struck me that um, one of the things your, your programs do more than anything else is kind of you know, the privilege of opening a door, supporting someone then when they fall, mentoring them, those privileges that, that some of us have, uh, have had someone's opened a door, someone's mentored us, someone's caught us when we fell. Those things, um, those, as we talk as a district about equity and it's about opportunity in learning, it seems like your programs can do almost, can be incredibly valuable tools to achieve to level out that privilege a little bit, right? To provide privileges of opportunity and, and mentoring and support where, you know, when it doesn't come from when they entered the school district. And, um, you know, it's not a magic bullet, but I'm just suggesting yeah. that it's worth investing in, is all I'm saying. Yeah, you know? I, I agree. I think there's incredible opportunity that may not be afforded based on whatever context of situational life that they're in. I agree. Yeah. What's your two sentence explanation when somebody says, ah oh, yeah, but 
how do you know that they've really been a success? You know, they're not getting an A, B, or C, right? <clears throat> so what, what in the system allows you to uh, assess that? Well, in most of the, um, yeah, in most, great question. <laughs> this, I actually didn't put, put this in there. I put it actually less, but I put a couple slides just so, but we, we, we do have really specific assessments within the, within the pathways um, and that are transcripted, they're assessed. And so it's not just a like cool experience and it, but they're really like we're really targeting like in community-based learning self-awareness responsibility responsibility to others and what are others responsibilities back to us and so kind of looking at that two-way street and so students are being assessed at that um, at those skills personalized studies there's content proficiencies that they're asked to demonstrate so th there's assessment there but then getting back to like yeah, so, the, so those are aligned with our, with our courses. Um, and, you know, measures of success, I, I think, um, you know, continually get students' feedback on their experiences, what worked for them, what didn't work for them, and then using that to integrate into our, our work moving forward. But I think kids are just coming back. Kids are, they're, they're turning kids away. So that's a marker. Um, that we're turning kids away that want to have these experiences because we're not staffed appropriately to support them in those ways. I think that's that's a marker. I would say that they don't get ABCs in class anymore. Right. Yeah. So when I'm at this is even squishier when somebody asks me about this compared it's to surprisingly not though in the kids ex like in my own experience. kids experience it's just as structured as class. There are rubrics. There are meetings with teachers. There's the same kind of assessment and the same kind of learning expectations in these things as there is in class. It's and a very, con a very consistent yeah. system across. And that's that's the game of school. We we don't want kids to have to navigate additionally right. how they need to like get credit or what they're going to be mm -hmm. assessed on. The more we can create consistency mm -hmm. across their general ed classes, and then they do a CBL. Like if there's consistency in reporting and assessment. <laughs> It's just, it just levels. That's good too, as far as equity goes, because some kids yeah. are just good at the game of school. And the kids that yeah. aren't mm -hmm. won't be able to negotiate that if That's it's right. different. So we're trying to remove that sort of navigational space that some kids and families may not be able to navigate as effectively. Yeah. And there's, there's so much work here. I mean, like, it's, it's cool, and I feel like we're, we're moving ahead. There's a lot more to do and get better at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, oh. Run an example. Yeah. Okay. In, in, independent study. So my daughter dances, and a bunch of the kids who dance take um, an independent study in order to get PE credit. Um, but it's quite structured. They can't just say, I went to dance. You know, <laughs> there's a rubric. There are expectations. They have to demonstrate proficiency, and they're, you know, it's just like class, but it's a, maybe a little more work because they have to independently um, set goals and report with it back to the teacher and so forth. But it's the same, it's their extracurricular activity, but then the, the school provides a structure that they put that into to demonstrate their proficiency. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel integrated into all the other initiatives going on in the school? Yeah. So, Oh, I just want to cut off. That's fine. I don't want to do no, a quick do time it. check. Why don't you answer that, and then we can? Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Off. <laughs> no, no, it's yeah, been no, it's no, been no, excellent. No, no. Um, but um, I just want to. The, the presentation was great, but I'd want to keep yeah. the keep yeah. the conversation <clears throat> to um, a minimum because we do we are over time. So. Yeah. Culturally, yes. Structurally, yes. Um, like me, is it like the, the, the program and the different pathways or? I, I just mean your programs integrated with the other initiatives going on in the schools around curriculum development and around you know, all the other things that we, we are working on. Yeah, um, integrated, yes. The, the, there is, a, I think, an inherent tension that needs, it's good to explore the tension between content um, <laughs> and personalization. And 
it's just it's just a natural tension that that exists. It's just, I mean, just to name it. Um, so, yes, but as we, yeah, there, that, that's that's where the tension point exists. Is you mean between developing curriculum and kind of standard. Uh, well, I guess proficiency type stuff versus. Like students who are taking algebra one or geometry and making sure that like all students, all students are are meeting proficiency and, and are supported throughout their experiences in those courses, sometimes requires those students to, you know, do extra, get additional support. And so then that potentially could remove some space for them to create some personalized experiences because they're really trying to just dig in on their math course you know to make sure and they might, they might be very motivated in that way um, but they also might be motivated to also seek out another opportunity so there's sometimes a tension that exists there um, yeah and because Jim called time <laughs> the, next, the way that we the, the next the next frontier is how do we work PLPs into our school in a meaningful, authentic way. You call time, right? Yes. We yes. should go. He's telling me to stop talking. No, that's another conversation. But there's so yes, but I, there's yeah. Um, there's. There's good work to be done there. Yeah, it's good work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, Matt. This is this is this is, uh, so this is a flagship program of our school, and you've done a fantastic job. Lately. Yeah, right. So we're very appreciative. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the time tonight. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm nowhere near as eloquent as Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Look at him. He's like, should I stay for this? Well, exactly. <laughs> um, so I'm sorry, he's a hard act to follow. This is not nearly as intriguing a topic. <laughs> but we'll go for it. Um, so I put together just all the information I could, we could think of in terms of what happens um, when somebody wants to use our facilities. So here's the process. Interested party to fill out a facilities use form, found it that at our web page, um, or they can call Tracy and get it. They, they mail scan and deliver this form to Tracy Lock. Tracy is in my office, of course. This is one third of her job. It's probably about two thirds of her time um, that she spends on building usage. Uh, Tracy works with party with the, whatever party concerning the pricing and to schedule events. And if the form has already been improved, you know, through past years or whatever, they just email Tracy. She's on a first name basis with most people who use our facilities. Um, and she, Tracy, is the one who communicates and schedules with custodial staff about the coverage and what's the setup that's required. So Tracy is really our point person here. Um, this is, oh, I actually forgot, I'm sorry, I forgot to bring the copies of this. I actually had copies of this for you. But this is just an idea of what a typical week of gym usage looks like across our district. And I know it's really small, but you can all see how packed, this is all after school. This is not during school hours, this is all after school. Um, so you can just see how packed they actually are. This is high school and middle school. Um, so she's doing um, usage of the building for our own use and for yes. paying use. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. For community paying use. Um, so if any one of you needed to use a conference room or something in the building, you would contact Tracy and say, I need to book the conference room. Anna can do it too, but Tracy does most of it and for their backup. Um, but but Anna can, can tell you that this this is a constant conversation <laughs> in, in between her and Tracy in the office and, um, and Andrew. Uh, so custodians, this is the contractual language that I referred to before with you all. Um, these two pieces are in the contract right now and 11.5 is what is being attempted to be negotiated out of the contract. That does not eliminate though the need for a custodian in a building if somebody is using our facilities. Um, but it does make us have to have one, unless it's Matt going in on a Saturday to do office work or whatever. Um, I'm sorry, so you're saying the difference there is uh, a contractual requirement versus what we would like what to have. we would want to do anyway, yeah. 11.5 was put in, it's archaic language, and it's my understanding from Heather, who's my, historic, or my historical perspective in all things contractual, um, that this was put in by a custo one custodian a long, long time ago who didn't like to go outside. And so <laughs> that's how this language is in there. It's just never been taken out. But I'm not sure of that piece. That's what Heather's perspective is. 
um, but it does require us to have custodians there. This is what they do when our facilities are used after school hours. They, of course, unlock and lock the facilities. They do the setup and breakdown. They make sure the sidewalk and the drive maintenance on snowy days so the users have safe access to the building. If somebody were to slip, that would be our liability. Um, they do any kind of damage repair, which there is damage repair, and they clean up after scheduled and unscheduled events, like pizza parties that happen <laughs> out of the blue. Um, they also make, the, you know, the cleanup is also bathroom usage, toilet paper, making sure there's toilet paper and, to, and paper towels the next day for school, um, making sure all of that happens. So they're quite busy during this time. They're not sitting around twiddling their thumbs. Um, the overtime cost of the district in 2018-19 was $38,400. That's not just for facilities usage. Um, there, there was a time in the worst time of the year for us in summer and early fall this year, very early fall, where we were down custodians. So some of this particular overtime is because of that, um, but not a huge amount of it. Um, so there, there is a time in the fall 2019 where there are a few custodians, particularly at MSMS and MHS, who worked a stretch of one month straight with no days off. And we're not talking regular eight hour shifts, we're talking 15 hour shifts for one month straight. That was during the construction, right? Um, it was during summer and fall, and it wasn't because of construction, it was because of facilities usage and the regular cleaning schedule of our custodians. Because when somebody schedules our building outside of facilities, Tracy has to go say, hey, which one of you guys want it? Um, and some, sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. Um, and if we've booked it, then we say, we need somebody, who, and, we, and she kind of twists arms a little bit. Um, so, so our custodial staff, I have to tell you, are fantastic. They are fan they're a fantastic team. We are almost fully staffed now. We're down 0.5 here in Roxbury. You see the guy out there is um, a roving custodian. So he's, he goes where, we, where he's needed. Right now he's needed in Roxbury because we haven't filled that position. The 0.5 position who was here, came, Donna came over to the high school to work. She transferred positions. Um, so they're working beyond their schedule hours on weekends. They're covering for weekend events. They're good people. They want to be here. We are paying them to be to do so. But um, I know for myself, I don't like to work, work seven days a week. You need days off, the, the families. Um, and we don't want to lose the staff that we have right now. It, right now in this job market, the idea of hiring a custodian, I think, gives Andrew LaRosa hives. Like, it's really hard to do right now. Um, Some luck, pressure on them to take those shifts? We don't pressure them in the sense of, like, we, we don't do that, but I feel um, they feel pressure because they care about the buildings, mm -hmm. right? So the, the pressure comes from their desire to make our buildings sparkling and to make sure that they're well taken care of all the time. Um, so there, there is, and that's coming from us, yeah. And, you know, we want our buildings to look great for, for kids on a daily basis and for the community, uh, but they really care. Like, they have a big role in the, the place we provide for, for learning, so, and they really care about it. We have an excellent staff. These are not people who just come in and clean. They are, they are excellent. They know students. They say hi, and Matt can agree. Mickey is one of the nicest people I've ever met in my life <laughs> and so dedicated. Um, so we want to really keep this crew, and if they're overworked, then they're not going to stay. So we should we be taking less rentals? Right. So there are times that we do say, no more rentals. We need to give our guys a break. Good. Um, we have said that. We've gotten pushback, a lot of pushback around that. I'm sure you do, but. Um, so we just wanted to put this out here that, like, they're working hard. They're working hard. Here's the pricing structure. This is a couple different slides. Um, this is very typical of Vermont public schools. Uh, we got U32s. We got Ferries. We got Randolphs. We got, I talked to Winooski. I talked to, um, Central Vermont, I've, I've talked to multiple superintendents and we've actually gotten the pricing in multiple places. The only place that does not charge for their gym is Twinfield at all. So that's not saying there might be under the cover, like, hey, Michelle, I know you, you come on in, you got keys to the building. I'm not saying that isn't happening. Who knows if that's happening in other buildings? But according to what their procedure is on file, there, everybody has a pricing structure. Um, so this is ours, educational and civic groups. Um, that are composed of 75% of MRPS students. There's no, this is the usage free. The, like we have a custodian on staff Monday through Friday, three through nine, so there's no usage fee for that. They're already here. So we don't charge them for anything. Um, this is for over, this is the overtime pay for Saturday, and this is the overtime pay for Sunday, is what it would represent. 
so then nonprofit groups in Montpelier and Roxbury. Um, so just for a, a case in point, the Montpelier Rec Gym for anybody to rent is $30 per hour. Just anybody. So we're right around where that is. All nonprofit groups not in Montpelier and Roxbury, those are the costs, and all for-profit groups in any other group that could fall under any other category besides nonprofit and children use. I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time with these four categories. So this is the usage fee. Yeah. This is the overtime custodian fee. Yeah. Does that make sense? No, but I, I, that's one in the it's groups. The four groups of people. The four groups. Oh. Okay. There's so this is these are kid groups, right? So like Girls on the Run or yeah. Green Mountain Youth Symphony. Okay, but not our not our groups. There there are other people. No, our if it's a school group like a basketball team. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. We're not charging. We're not charging. So they're 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 student. They're groups with a lot of local students, basically. Yeah. Boy Scouts, you know, like they're usually during the week, but you know, so things like that. Um, but other nonprofit groups. Uh, Brian Gallagher does the board for the Mountaineers. The Mountaineers yeah. is a nonprofit group, right? But they're not. They don't have students on that board, and they use our building. Uh, right. At least once a month. So they'd be in the first group. Yeah. Okay. They, no, they're in the second group. They're oh, in the I'm second sorry. group. Because they they're, Cause not they're not students. Kids. They're not for kids. Right. Okay. Sorry. Right. Um, and then these are these uh, don't uh, represent our community, but they okay. want to use our facility. Right. And these are the for profits. Mm -hmm. Local or otherwise. Yes. Um, so here are revenues. So in fisc fiscal year eighteen. The revenue was twenty thousand four hundred eighty-six dollars. Nineteen was eleven thousand two hundred eighty-three, but it was very limited because of all the bond work that was happening. So a lot of our our facilities were closed for large chunks of time, and so far this year, which our bond did, has limited this year so far too because of uh, July, August, and September, seven thousand two hundred three. That's where we are so far. For January. No, 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 sorry. <laughs> it's it's that calendar year. July. Yeah, fiscal year. I was like, what happened? Got it, got it, got it. Yes. We'd be making a lot more money. Um, so here's our dibs list on who gets who gets rental space. So obviously school sports or school activities and any type of school events, school clubs and unified programs, after school programming is right there. And then the rec center is actually in our MOU to have them have first dibs after all school events. And then outside rentals have our fifth after that. MRS, or MRPS employees are not charged for building use or custodial services if we're working with students outside of school hours. So a good example of that is Tom Sabo does a lot of work with students around climate. He uses our library on Sundays. He, he can get in. He has his, his passcode, so there's no need to get a custodian here. He's with our kids in probably since 32 and North He doesn't make a mess. We know where to go, yeah. so, yeah. right? <laughs> is number is number two on that number one on the previous list? No, no. that's no. still school clubs. That's school activity. It's not a. It's not a community. Oh, act, it's not a community yeah. activity using the school. It's a. School it's run activity. by somebody who is our employee, yeah. um, and through and our students. So what would would number one on that list fall into here? Five. Five. Because mm -hmm. it's yeah. outside. It's yeah. totally. Okay. Well, number yeah yeah. 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 Okay. Or, or, or four, 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 in central Vermont, easy to get to. So there are other tournament requests that are not representing our community. Capital Soccer is enormous. They are asking actually for more gym time because I believe they just lost a gym space that they used somewhere else. I'm not sure where that is, but it's a, it was a building. It was an outside entity that they've somehow lost that space. So now they're asking for way more of our safe and they want to book it out years in advance now. Um, they serve primarily Montpelier students. Um, their coach, John, is under the employee of our district. He coached girls soccer and he coaches something else too, I think. Just up down as the girls coach. Does he, he coach something else too? 
Maybe. I feel like he's always in our school. <laughs> he's, he's, a sub, he's a substitute. Okay, that makes but, sense then. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know him, so. Um, and then the rare occasion that for big yearly events that are held in the community, um, Bernie Sanders, or, or there, there is the rare, rare. Bella Fleck, Bella Fleck. Yeah. Touch oh, a trick. Like it's like there's some other venue had a problem. It's like there's some other venue had a problem. No, because the high school auditorium is the largest, the largest venue physical. in Central Vermont. Yeah. 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 Remember, we're, uh, this is just about gym usage, too. Yeah. This yeah. is not about our other facilities usage, although uh, the revenues were totals for our, the entire facilities use. But, including auditorium yeah. and other spaces. Yeah. So using Capital Soccer as an, advance, as an example, so a couple questions come to mind there. So how much is too much for one group to dominate the space? And then the other question would be if there's a substitute teacher who happens to be also a school member of that group, does that then exempt them from paying? Up until this point, John was an employee <laughs> of ours. So they aren't, Capital Soccer is a for-profit entity. Um, so we charge them the for-profit for -profit rate. rate. Okay. Yeah. And then how much is too much in terms of? That's the question that we're that asking Dibs right question, now. Really? They just mm -hmm. asked us for to book out yeah, two, years in, two years, right? They just asked us that, to book it out two years in advance and because they just lost this other space. So that is the exact question that we're like, do we, don't we? You know, like, is that smart or not? Um, so changes that have contributed to the book gym. So I went to my historians um, to find out what's changed. Why, why this kerfuffle now? What's happening? Um, so number one, Ultimate Frisbee went from a club to a school sport at both MHS and MSMS, and they practice nearly year round and they booked the gym. And as we went to the dib side, they have first dibs on the gym. Um, so they use the gym pretty much every weekend. The girls are at Main Street every Sunday and the boys are at the high school every Saturday or every Sunday. Volleyball became a school sport which heavily influences fall scheduling. That takes, that's a gym sport, so it takes up gym time. Spring sports are heavily dependent on weather and have nearly half of their season of practices in the gyms. So these contribute to very booked solid gyms. And I'd also probably add to that is that, um, and I don't know if this is a change or not, but there are lim there's limited gym space in Montpelier. And, so. and as the population of the high school increases, some of the sports with a loss um, may come back Maybe. and they would be number one. Maybe. Um, did, the, did our rates change? No. Okay. Not that I know of. But not um, recently, anyway. Not in my tenure. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the high school floor maintenance. So this is just maintenance schedules. Andrew had asked some questions around that. Well, can't they just? Um, which we need to recognize and respect custodians' time, schedules, all that kind of stuff. I consider them the expert in this. So um, in floor maintenance at the high school is late August. They prep the floor. They install the volleyball court lines. They seal it. Um, all of that kind of work, it, it costs $900. You'll find out why in a second, why I'm putting that in there. In November, they do very similar things, and that's about $2,300 for that work. Uh, Main Street Middle School floor maintenance, they do this November break stuff as well at a cost of $1,800. Uh, this November, a community member using a key that he had personally that he shouldn't have had, went in, stepped over caution lines, stepped on the wax floor that was just done and cost us an additional $1,800 because we needed to redo that. When I found out about that, I, I said, we need to change the locks. Um, well, my first question was, how many keys are in the community? Just curious, like, who's got those keys? No one you know? I bet. And that was, the, <laughs> that was the answer I got. Who knows, Lib, it's, it's, a, it's a school. So I said, let's change the locks. Um, so the locks were changed that week. Um, so we, we recognize that that's a major safety issue if we're not sure who has keys to our buildings. Um, and it's not respecting that there were caution, there's caution tapes that were stepped over. So, so uh, the maintenance schedules are pretty tight and we've, we've pretty much taken access away from, from people who are not employees of the district. Um, going forward, so the guidance from the board we, there's equitable pricing for various groups across building use. It, gyms are not the only area that we have a high demand for. Um, the cost of coverage for custodial needs, the electricity, the toilet paper, the paper towels, all of that kind of thing, that's well over $40,000 for the district to cover this cost. 
So there's Mary's Crest to get rid of the cost structure. Um, that's what it would cost us. Um, and, and this is just another note to consider. All requests go through Tracy from the reasons that I said before. They don't go through me. They, you know, they don't go through you all. They go through Tracy because she's the, she's the center point to all of this. She's who Tom Allen goes to. She's who we all go to for this kind of work. And, and she's had one gym request in the past two months um, for people who hadn't already scheduled this gym time. So the, the concern that I'm hearing in the community of when are they gonna fix this problem, they still haven't fixed this problem. This problem has not come to us because Tracy has not gotten the requests, right? She hasn't had to turn anybody down. It, it happened once and it happened literally the day I made the slide and sent it to Tracy and, and Andrew and Tom to say check this over to make sure this is all factual. What's the problem we're talking about? Um, community community wishing. No, I know I was there, but it wasn't, it was about money. It wasn't about access. That's not the, the story that's been re relayed to me. It's about pricing and access. Oh, I didn't hear, I just heard the money part, okay. Yeah, I've heard both, that, okay. that there's no access to it and um, the pricing stinks. Okay. So, so sh I think that's just conversations for this board to have, is that um, there are realities here to people using our facilities outside of the school day that aren't just custodial, aren't just cleaning. We're paying for the electric, we're paying for the setup, we're paying, for, they use our computers, they use our smart boards, they use the technology, um, they use their electricity and toilet paper and paper towels and all of that adds up. So we put about, it's well over about $40,000 for all the additional facilities usage. If we're not charging people, which is an option for you all to tell me to do, <laughs> don't charge anybody, then we have some budgetary problem, things that we have to fix. Not problems, but things we have to fix. So. Question: yeah. do, do they also have to um, put some kind of deposit down in case there is damage? No, they don't. They oh. just pay. They just pay the fee. Interesting question. Yeah, I don't see how we can have both a scheduling problem and a pricing problem. <laughs> <laughs> you you free market people. Because <laughs> <laughs> if we're fully booked, then our prices are a over. Thanks, Legit. <laughs> Also, peak demand pricing should be in there too, right? <laughs> right during, during winter. No, don't give us any ideas. Um, this is this is it. I mean, this is. I just wanted to lay out all the factors to the board. Um, and so, as as you continue, I know to get push from the community um, around our gym usage and how do we make this easier. Um, we're not denying kids access to the gym. We have denied community members who had keys previously to the gym. We are denying that access and asking them to go through Tracy to schedule it. Yeah, that should be the case. Yes. Good job. And, and, <laughs> so, Thank you. <laughs> so there have been changes, and I recognize there have been changes. Um, but the, and nobody this, likes changes. So. Yeah. So what, what is the change? Is the change that community members that had keys and could walk in at any time and play basketball no longer can? Yes. OK. <laughs> <laughs> that is a major change that has happened. Okay. Plus the addition of other sports and yeah, and, and they're used. The band has gotten yeah, yeah, they're they are absolutely used. Yeah. Absolutely, not a doubt about that. Our whole Montpelier High School is mm -hmm. used. I All mean, you time. guys are here. Well, days. even I coached girls on the run, and it was ridiculous because we were assigned a gym in the elementary school, but there were always like three people assigned to both gyms in the elementary school every week. It was impossible. Yeah, I and mean, we've so. tried to eliminate that kind yeah. of overscheduling, and Tracy does a really nice job at organizing the mayhem, yes. the mayhem here. And I don't, there's, I truly believe, there's like one of the first education books I read in college, and the, like that was a long time ago, so that's how much this, this is connected to me, that schools should be the most opening and welcoming place right. in the community. And I truly believe that, um, and school districts, you all have realities that we have to pay for. <laughs> and our um, kids should come first. And they do. Yeah, but yeah. I think the question is not, I think you stated it right, but the question is the balance, is are we at the right balancing point yes. right now? Mm -hmm. And I think that would be the guidance from the board. Yeah. On the cost piece, Libby, two budgets ago, this overtime thing on the weekends had come up before. I thought we budgeted for 
more weekend staff or custodians. We did. That's in our budget this year that you all approved and hopefully for this voters. coming year. For the coming year, it was that will help. Okay. That well, that overtime will turn future. into a salary now. Yeah. For some reason, I thought we'd done that previously. I thought we were a little bit ahead of that curve, mm -hmm. but no, it's okay. we talked about it. <laughs> Are we open and welcoming financially to the people we want to be? In other words, so the, the the group of it was a fairly diverse group of of men. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what I mean is it was a fairly group, diverse group of clubs. Uh, some were adults, some were kids, and they had concerns. What, um, and I, I guess the question, you know, I remember, the one, I, the one I've heard follow up from is Peter, of course, and he said, um, you know, it's really just that 60 some bucks every time we come in, have to do it. That's really what he cares about, um, is that that becomes prohibitive. and. So the question would be, what's the, I think it's because they need, need an hour and a half or two hours or something probably. It's probably two hours is probably the reason. Two so hours on a Saturday. Yeah, well, are probably. you referencing Mini Metro and AAU? Or are you referencing no, his, him his his originally thing basketball? was the men's not, No, not the, he doesn't care about the adult thing. It's the kids. He's doing a kids group. I don't know what it is. Anyway, the number was 65, it's I think. A, probably AAU. Would be yeah, that's probably right. And um, it definitely so not they the, fall in this category not the one Brian right yeah. yeah. And so the question was, is, is, is that okay with us to say, you know what, it's, he, his argument was that it's mostly kids, mostly Montpelier kids, and it's prohibitive financially for them to be using their own community's gymnasium after Actually, hours. No, they fall under this one. I don't yeah, know. I was going to say, the, same the, same the rate is the same regardless. Yeah, they just don't pay yeah. the facilities fee. Yeah. And that's a nonprofit group. Right. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. And I just don't, and I don't know how to answer that. I know that it's a fair question to say $65 for every single practice. Is that what this district wants to be charging a group that's bringing kids in? And is that, if it, if it discourages the program, are we at the right balancing point? Yeah, since we don't have room, I don't. Well, I mean, it's. I mean, I have two questions. One, is it actually discouraging the program? And second, I mean, yeah, it's $60 for how many kids? For how many, yeah. What yeah, does that, right. and is that, yeah, that might be $6 a kid. Also, yeah. every, who every every accesses week, AAU? You know. Which kids? Good basketball players. Yeah, yeah. right, like middle class family basketball well, players. That's not, not necessarily. That's not that has been mostly my experience <laughs> of AAU. <laughs> <laughs> like, that, that was a leading question. I was saying my experience of AAU is that it's kids who already have lots of access to lots of things. Um, and then my other question was about like, yeah, per head, how much are we talking here? Like. If there are 20 kids who come in and it's $60. I'd say week. a typical AAU team is probably about 15 players, Matt. Is that fair? And uh, so if you're at $60, that's or about the kid, yeah. Per week. practice. <laughs> the, um, For an eight week season. $32 a kid. Is it an eight week season? I'm probably about, it's an eight to 10 week season, yeah. yeah. And then I, you know, and then that brings back in the capital soccer kind of question is, is there a where does where that you're saying that would fall into group one, which would still be at the bottom of the Capital? group's list? No, Capital. no, this AEU thing that we're talking about. It would be maybe in group one here, and in the dibs list, it mm -hmm. falls as number five, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as would Capital Soccer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They would just pay a higher rate, but they would be on par. Mm -hmm. And is that the balance we want? Like um, a for-profit versus a non-profit, for instance. And I don't even know if AAU is a non-profit. I assume it is. I think, I think but, it probably is. Yeah. Probably the problem is when you're tight on the schedule, mm -hmm. you have to prioritize. And maybe your question is, how are we doing that? What are the rules for prioritizing? That's another question. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't Oops, I was going wrong. I don't know. The, I don't the think we don't, and then we don't prioritize among Number five, like yeah. within number five, there aren't. It's first come first. first yeah. 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 I mean, the other thing would be is is the costs that we have. Do we have to incur those costs for every? group that rents, and let me just play that out just a little bit further, because I think those are all important things to get done, but uh, for instance, you could create something where you had a prefer preferred 
responsible party kind of person. They, they're bonded. They have. Tr they've been trained. They are, you know, a person who is some in some way gets certified to bring people into the building, and that there's a high level of responsibility on that person, and therefore they're able to avoid some of the the costs for so that. So do we give them keys? I, I no. don't. Wait, it's passive. Yeah, it's, it's electronic keys, right? Okay. Is it is it done where everybody has their own? Yes. Well, and then how, why do we do that for some groups and not for others? Yeah. If they go through the certification, the certification process, certification. which is a repeat yeah. group, repeat pro adult who is repeat, who is that one person has effectively gotten gone through a training <laughs> process. What we have also seen, uh, it, uh, the keys concerns me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because whether it's card or key, it doesn't matter. The access concerns mm -hmm. me because we have on videotape, <laughs> on surveillance footage, um, people who have not had keys, but they have gotten in, and because they're keys, we can see who the name is attached yeah, to said absolutely. key. Absolutely. And it's not the person who's in the gym. Right. So they're being, they were previously being passed around community <coughs> members sure. um, for access to the gym. Right, but then that person not only loses their preferred status, but their bond goes away. Which right. is what happened. We turned the key off. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I respect the security need. I'm just, I just know there are ways to do things around training people and holding them accountable. I'm not I mean, I guess given the amount of people there. There's a very, once we've filled it all up with the things that are our kids, there's very few spaces left is what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure putting in place such an elaborate system for those very few spaces beyond mm -hmm. first come, first serve, which we fill up. Right. Well, it's worth it. To, and to be quite honest with you, for a cost that is not, I mean, it's a cost. I'm not going to say it's not a cost, but it is not an enormous cost on, like, a kid's basketball group to do eight weeks if they've got a reasonable number. And if there are, you know, it's one of those things, okay, say it's four bucks a kid for eight weeks, so, you know, 32, 40, 32 bucks, you know, per kid for access for a season, you know, probably... 70 to 80 percent of those kids can afford it, so charge the kids 45 bucks. It's not what we heard from the, the community. I mean, you can you can say we disagree with the public that came in here, but they said it is. A problem. So you're just saying, yeah, but that's they may think it's a problem, but you don't think it's a problem. That's what I'm asking. Well, I'm saying, is it a prohibitive problem, or they said it? They said it is. Or they, they're not oh. doing it as a result. I don't know. People do not come to the board. What's that? We did not have people come in. Yeah, yeah, we yes, we did. Four people come in. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it was well, like a, it's been a while now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's been a while. Yeah. I mean, I didn't hear that they weren't doing it because of the cost. I heard yeah. that they didn't they like didn't the cost. Like the cost made right. it harder. But I didn't hear we can't play basketball because of this I cost. Heard, I didn't hear right. that either. And what yeah. they showed yeah, us the number, our gym rates compare to the yeah. other option yeah. that yeah. is here. Yeah. It's just that there is only one What was the point of access that you took away from that? I didn't. I don't remember that. Um, my perception, and it could very well just be how I read this, so I'll put that out there, <laughs> is that um, for certain groups there was open access to the gym because of keys that were available, oh. and that has been taken away, oh. and that's a that's the major okay. change in that situation. And that's it, my perspective, so I want to make yeah. sure that's clear. Well, that may be really what's happening. But I, don't, <laughs> I don't remember that being said. No, and that was said. There was oh. saying that you know, why can't the gym just kind of why can't we just have why can't, kind why of can't of just be open? open. Yeah. Be open. Like, I thought there was another issue of the yeah, re like fairly was, recently they were not charged, but um, because, because they had keys. The custodian. They oh, yeah. I got it. okay. Yeah. Mm. They we, were not scheduling through us. They mm. were going. Showing up. Yeah. With the keys that they had access to. But I mean, story. yeah, which yeah. exactly. But I, I did not hear. We cannot pay six dollars. We cannot afford this. I heard why can't this be open? It would be users open. It, you know, it's a, it's a tax, you know, tax dollars pay for this. Why can't we just have an open gym? I did not hear from anyone. Sixty dollars. This cost is prohibitive. If this, yeah, if we have to pay this cost, we cannot play basketball, and we cannot. To be, use to the be gym. fair, the more was that we've had one request for a gym. That person was an AAU parent, um, right. and she and Tracy told, yeah, sure, the gym, you can have the gym at this time, this time, this time. It will cost you this, the same stock answer so that there she was would a give. Incident where that happened. This this last one, she said, um, 
but they have false information. So, so she said, the parent wrote back and said, um, that's really expensive to rent the gym. Barry doesn't charge, U32 doesn't charge, which is not accurate. Okay. They do charge, mm -hmm. it's on their website. There may be people Although who have they may access in a different yes, way. They may not also, because for, they may, so U32 may publish a rate schedule but then they also, I think, make deals. Yeah, because yeah, I know right. like, that are internal. Green right? Mountain Youth Symphony won't use Montpelier because it's too expensive. Because it would cost them like three hundred three hundred dollars a week for two rooms for five hours. Mm. So, but they use U thirty two, which supposedly has the same rates, but actually doesn't charge them. Well, that's that's that good information. Rate, so. so, if it is private, then. Well, it's, it's only pro it's not prohibitive according to our comparable rate schedule. It's because they have a deal yeah, with the other schools. Okay. So that is to the question. We could make a deal if we were inclined to do that. But so that gets to this question right here. It's right. the equitable pricing. Who would you like me to make a deal with and who would you not like me to make a deal with? And please tell me exactly who those people are. Because I don't want well, a group I mean, of bagpipe players in it, my office talking to me about that. <laughs> no, but I, something like that, it could go to, it, it could go to multiple use. If you have a league that's gonna use it as a regular time, then maybe you do cut a deal, but if it's a one-time use, you don't. Because then, then you're talking about costs that do add up. It's almost like a contract over time is a better rate than a, yeah. than a one time use. Like if you're going to use this every Saturday from 11 to 12 for practice for a season, okay, we'll, we'll make it 40 bucks a pop for that. But if you're just coming in, I just want this Saturday and maybe I'll call you up in five weeks and want another Saturday. I think that would have to reflect actual cost, though, for that to be something we'd want to do. So if, right. and that gets back to this idea of, is there an adult who truly is responsible, not just says they are, and who would truly save us money by being present over time and knowing the rules and insisting on the rules? But I think we need our custodial staff. Yeah, yeah there's so many other pieces to that. I mean, the pizza party is a real thing, right? right. But, and, the, oh, and the bathrooms, are yeah. they, is yeah. your responsible person really going to go and make sure that all the bathrooms have wouldn't. toilet yeah. paper? And all that kind of if cost yeah. really is an issue, could we set aside a certain amount of money that people could apply for, like a, you know, a grant or something? You know, just a simple. And then we just verify, okay, you're, you know, you but, don't have funds, or is that just too complicated? It seems complicated yeah, given the amount of time like, that's already going into. But I, I would say there, there is a cost savings with someone who does it consistently, which is the administrative cost. Yeah. If you just have, right. like, if you have to schedule eight different events, mm -hmm. it's different than schedule, yeah. you know, one event for eight different sessions. Mm -hmm. You're just working with the same person, you know what's coming in, you just mark it on the calendar for eight weeks, you know that's going to be so-and-so's basketball group. Um, or GMYS, yeah. the whole entire school year. Exactly. <laughs> well, yeah, that was what you're suggesting, Jim, different than what we do. Because you don't give, you don't have, because. I just want to make sure I'm clear. Okay, so. He's looking for a discount for. So like with GMYS, like if, GM, if GMYS said we're going to use U32 randomly and we're just going to call up and schedule the U32 person every time we do it, yeah, then it would be, you know, maybe they use it 50 times over the year. Instead of what they're doing is they're saying every Monday. Saturday morning from 9 to 11, we're going to have practice there. Book us for the whole year, but don't charge us. So New 32 does that, and they say, okay, we know we're dealing with, with Leah. We know they're coming in. That's their block. So instead of charging them for all you know, 20, 30 uses, as if each time you're charging the full amount, we're going to give you like a discount rate for the whole year. So that there's a be, reduced rate. So there's a reduced, use. like a seasonal rate, as opposed to a per-use rate. Although it still seems like we're not paying our costs at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We're not. Well, that's the balance question. Right. What's the value oh, to right. us? Because we're also have, supposed to be providing something. What do we want the youth symphony to be in our building, right? Like that feels like a lost opportunity to have that engagement with and the community. You're, and yeah. you're, you're scheduling this room, but you don't have. Is it really all money? This, yeah. Remember, that's a that's a different cost structure too. So just yeah. keep that in mind. Because it's not a gym. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, the 
the you have the price. Do you have the pricing sheet in your yeah. board packet? Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that to consider is going back to this, right? Somebody schedules it for a year. We we want a custodian for an outside organization in our buildings during that time. It, now we have you're paying yeah. for it every single Saturday for the right now we have put in a weekend custodian so these will have to shift right because we don't charge people the custodial fee if there's yeah. already a custodian on staff no. so that doesn't happen right Saturday Sunday currently even like a weekend or would we have a weekend custodian I mean that's in our budget I know but is it weekend or is it evening or what is it do we know where we're putting that person the new person, person was weekend. a weekend that's a weekend weekends. custodian job to Not after help, hours. to help with this. Yeah. Yeah. No, because we have custodians who are anyway. here yeah. until nine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this so. is only a weekend issue, never an evening issue, really. Not really. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Um, so this we'll have to change this anyway, hmm. based on. But we still want to cover costs. If the voters, co you know, it, well, this would this covers a considerable overtime cost, right? It covers right. the overtime custodian. Right. Because even because if they're going gonna, through main we're street, we're going to have just high... a regular custodian right. on the weekend. In right. Both in all three buildings? No, we'll have one Four that buildings? could go through to different buildings. Okay. This but building does not get used in the same way. Okay. Um, UES does not get used in the same way. UES is more weekday rentals. People don't access UES necessarily on Saturday and Sundays. But Main Street and the high school are big time, yeah. Might have. They'll have one person that can go back and forth between the two, the two areas. I think is the because the person doesn't have to be there all day. They that can. person isn't a isn't a security guard. No, <laughs> it's to they're make sure they're in, supervising. make sure walkways are clear, make yeah. sure they're you know it's cleaned up afterwards, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Hmm. They don't have to actually be present. All they're right. kind of a security guard, but not like a lockdown. We're trying to guard. not. I what mean, they've you? gotten into some situations like that that have caused us to talk about how do we block off areas of the building yeah. because kids are running rampant in the building. Oh, God. Um, so we have had to, our, and our guys don't need and to And that's not that in position. the job. Yeah. 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 I just mean more, like, the reason we want them here is because we don't want someone who's not supposed to be here to here, and we yeah. also want There's the a safety things issue. to be left yeah. reasonably. Yeah. 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 Anyway. Yeah. Okay. So, so all the facts. See, we like, have this spring, hopefully, but voters will agree to our budget, and we will be able to find an amazing not going to the park weekend custodian, and <laughs> some of this gets eliminated ish, or it's some of this easy. We we revise this right yeah. when that goes into play, but you all have all the facts. Thank but you. You might yeah. just want to check with U thirty two about what deals they're cutting, <laughs> because yes. or you know yeah I don't know. If find out what I can find out about paying. that I, I truly I equity is a big thing for our district and it's a big value of mine personally so I really need some guardrails as to right but I just think if went. there's if they're coming and saying we pay $15 for basketball practice at U32 like it it's almost like um price matching at Target or whatever. You know? Michelle, I think but, one of the things that came up that night was that U32, was, their teams were practicing in our spaces. Which is not accurate. Was no. not, okay. Yeah. Based on our data, yes. it is not accurate. But I think that, that was presented. That if teams have U32 that, students, there's also Montpelier students on those teams. Gotcha. And if U32 is offering their facilities in an unequitable way, I do not wish to emulate that. Well, yeah. but, but the word equity. Now, I mean, I just want to be careful here. So if equity is a big deal to us, then charging big fees to get into things is not equitable. Equitable would, the only way to get there is to reduce fees. I think we're talking about fairness, not equitable. Equity. Yeah, fairness is just okay. means trying to apply the rules okay. fairly to everyone. I want right? to be fair. But equity is really, it runs counter to what we're talking about. Equity would mean making sure there are no financial barriers to using the space or that they're leveled out somehow. So I don't think we really care much at all about equity in this conversation. I think we care about trying to have some rules that are easy to administer. And I think that if we do care about and equity, then we do. Fair. fair is fine, but equitable, I mean, I just, you know, and I know that word means both things, but what I mean is that we use that word in a very mm -hmm. loaded way in a right. school district, and I want to okay. reserve it for that in a sense, you know, because money is a, is a barrier, 
And that means some groups, like the Capital Soccer or the AAU, whoever's got money, and they may have internal systems, but there's a barrier to kids who just want to come and use the space. You know, I'm not necessarily going to bat for a big solution here, but I do think this is a balancing test, ultimately. Uh, like good. Thank you for the information. You're welcome. Yeah, awesome. yes, I put it in your lips. <laughs> 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 Very savvy. Yeah. 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 I'm not getting direction. I can't do anything. <laughs> We go into executive session for the purpose of discussing labor negotiations and Board other things. personnel. Um, superintendent. Uh, superintendent evaluation. Second. I shouldn't have initiated that. Did you make those cookies? Oh, um, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed?